August 1943, Canada. At the first Quebec conference, Allied chiefs were planning new strategy. Expecting European victory in a year, the Allies now marshal their forces against Japan. The President knew that distances had put a premium on long-range air power. To strike Japan, he had a new weapon. Roosevelt promised 200 B-29 superports by March 1944. Inside the Chateau Frontenac at the Joint Chiefs Conference, General Arnold proposed to pierce the inner zone of Japan's homeland with the unbuilt bombers from bases to be erected in China. It was a bold plan. At the time of the Quebec Conference, we only had 11 superforts. Hap Arnold's motto was to become famous. He announced, the difficult we do immediately. The impossible takes a little longer. There were only seven months to keep the promise. It was a race with time. We aircraft workers came from all walks of life. A few of us had built planes in World War I. We were a part of the strength of America, now working for Boeing, Bell, and Martin. Their factories had sprung up across the country, in Georgia, Kansas, Nebraska, in the state of Washington. Things had certainly changed. In 20 years, America's aviation industry had come of age. Unskilled workers became highly productive because the cranes and jigs and tools were so designed. Boeing engineers helped us make a new wing that could carry more weight faster and higher than any we'd ever built. In each plane, there were 55,000 numbered parts. Thousands of miles of wiring, a million rivets. From its transparent nose to its tail, this was a complicated machine. Nevertheless, the Air Force ordered the assemblies like pieces for a giant jigsaw puzzle. By December, only four months after the President's promise, we put together 35 superforts. Then, every hour of every day, identical miracles of modern machinery were brought together. We workers witnessed an inspiring sight, a welding of vision and reality, of free men and their need for peace, of national defense and American industry. Building this superfort was the climax in the history of man's conquest of the air. giant, spreading 141-foot wings, was born. By the end of January, 142 superforts were accepted. Three quarters of America's promise and our pipelines were full. Here were 65 tons of fighting fury, the biggest, fastest, and most powerful bomber in the world. Now our sons and brothers could take the B-29 to war. In sharp contrast, halfway around the world in China, the other half of the Superfort miracle unfolded. Armies of laborers were building a network of air bases almost by hand. These lean, sinewy Chinese, measuring their work by the remaining Earth pyramids, wrote a magnificent chapter in the saga of the Superfort, 2,000 years after their ancestors had built the Great Wall for the defense of China. Here were the same primitive methods, 
baskets and hose, muscles and goodwill, and wheelbarrows which squeak to keep imaginary devils away. With the machinery of only their million hands, stone by stone was patiently set. A modern Chinese wall was taking shape. Under the direction of 26 American officers and enlisted men, and at a cost of $150 million, 1,000 men gangs, following their own flagmen, rolled out four great air bases. April 24th became a day for us in the 20th Bomber Command to remember. General Saunders and Colonel J. Carman led the B-29 parade into Chengdu. Nearly all the immense airfields were ready for business. They had been built in only three months. Here was our superfort. It had hopped the Atlantic, Africa, and India. It flew from Kansas to China in a week. It didn't seem possible, but only a year and a half after the first experimental B-29 was flown, a fleet of American aerial dreadnoughts were arriving in China. Next stop, Japan. Within 10 days, our Asiatic strength was 130 super forts. Directed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff because of our long range and power, we were the first units of the 20th Air Force. The President's promise was being kept. With more super forts on the way, the runway builders never stopped. In China, a land of miracles, unskilled hands were pounding out a path to victory. Meanwhile, in Japan, 1,500 miles to the east, other hands had forged a modern war machine. Geared for war since 1928, their production rolled on. Like the Germans, they believed their empire invulnerable. Since Pearl Harbor, steel capacity had doubled. One third was hammered into ships, ships to exploit conquered lands, ships to support far-flung military forces. Though suffering from shipping sunk by the Allies, Japan maintained the world's third largest merchant fleet with continued launchings. Their island empire with Korea and Manchuria, connected by an efficient merchant marine, formed an industrial empire three times larger than Germany. Their ground forces had expanded to five million fanatics, nearly four times their strength at the time of Pearl Harbor. As the conquerors of half a billion people, they had to be stopped. By June, our bases in China were working around the clock. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had ordered an attack gun Japan. How many bombers could be sent? Our answer was 50. Not enough, get at least 70. A maximum effort was necessary. It would relieve enemy pressure in East China, help the invasion of Saipan, our future Pacific base. Our target was Yawata, Japan's heavily guarded Pittsburgh. Yawata, which made one-fifth of all Jap steel. General Wolfe was winning the big gamble. His idea to train our crews while we tested the experimental B-29 was putting both men and planes in combat six months sooner. We were doing the impossible. become airborne. Almost the entire force ordered for this historic mission.
followed the lead ship named Lady Hamilton. We followed General Blondie Saunders and his pilot, Colonel Howard Engler. We followed the Marines who landed on Saipan this morning. We headed out high over the Yangtze River. Guided by our navigators, we began the long hop across the Yellow Sea. said we'd be back, and we were. Superforts had struck Japan. Land-based planes dropped bombs through clouds on Yawata. Damage was done to the Kokura arsenal. Punishment to the steel industry was not extensive, but the B-29 Blitz was underway. A global bomber and a global air force were in operation. The beginning of the end of the Japanese Empire was underscored in exploding bombs that reminded the Japs of Pearl Harbor. The growing systematic waves of destruction had started. From China and later from Saipan, the Allies were forging a huge nutcracker to crush the enemy. General Arnold's determined order, make them the biggest, gun them the heaviest, and fly them the farthest, was carried out. He warned the enemy, no part of the Japanese Empire is now out of our range. No war factory too remote to feel our bombs. The battle for Japan is now underway with full speed ahead. January 1944, Germany. Sprawling Nazi factories, fattened by the wealth of conquest and methodically mobilized, produced weapons for Hitler's war machine. After surviving the intensive bombing of 43, their assembly lines doubled production. With painstaking German efficiency, the Luftwaffe grew alarmingly stronger. By February, destruction of the mounting Nazi manufacture became urgent because their production was rising to the goal of a plane every 15 minutes. Twelve of these factories in Germany and Poland were called point-blank targets and were given top priority. Hitler had looted the manpower and machinery of nearly a dozen European countries. Hermann Goering, his time running out, spawned reinforcements and new weapons. Thus, the Luftwaffe had become a massive shield for Fortress Europe. At the same time, steel centers like Dusseldorf and Essen forged mountains of bombs and shells. A key to this production was the transport system. All the supply lines, including canals, were full. The enemy war machine rolled on after a winter during which weather had prevented large-scale Allied air attacks. On 19 February, weather cleared. Now we started the long-planned attack against the Luftwaffe to win control of the skies over Europe, no matter what the cost. This was to pave the way for invasion. General Eisenhower and his air officers, General Spots and Kepner, watched our joint effort. 
Motel came from Doolittle's 8th Air Force and Bill Kepner's Fighter Command. The stiffest resistance was expected. To protect a thousand bombers, we were sending along a thousand fighters. We were going to destroy the Luftwaffe from the bottom up. Nazi factories, Nazi airdromes, and Nazi planes in the sky. Most of General Pete Casada's 9th Air Force fighter boys had come from units of the 8th. The battle-wise general had helped drive the Luftwaffe out of Africa. Now Casada was getting us ready for a series of operations which free people will always remember as the Big Week. Sunday morning, 20 February. We prepared for the heaviest assault in the history of the American strategic air forces up to that time. Doubtful weather and a stronger Luftwaffe made this a big gamble. Some expected possible losses up to 200 bombers and crews. This was the prelude to invasion. Generals Brereton, Spots, and Vandenberg hurried to join the show. American heavy bombers from Britain and the Mediterranean and all the RAF could muster, the equivalent of five air forces, were about to hit the Nazis for six consecutive days and nights. In the biggest air blitz of the war, the Allies hoped to finally win air superiority over the Luftwaffe. The liberation of Europe was at stake. Now, for the first time, the AAF had the strength to mount a saturation offensive. Bombers went to attack airfields and rocket launching sites to pull enemy strength away from the war factories, our main objective. At fighter bases, all fighter command elements were raising the curtain for the prelude to invasion. Takeoff signals marked a change in the basic use of all fighters. Until now, they had only escorted the bombers. This was expanded. Today's orders were, pursue and destroy the enemy. Success of the Allied offensive depended on these escort fighters. Our bombers plowed into enemy air, although we knew they had a spot. We tried to make our main effort appear as a two-pronged drive on Berlin. Ignoring the flak, we kept in close formation for maximum self-protection as our thunderbolts caught up. Forewarned, the enemy massed his fighters. They were as determined to stop us as we were to destroy them. Control of the sky, German sky, was the prize. Mustangs dropped their wing tanks and plunged into the fight. Leading was an Ohio boy, Captain Don Gentile. Another hot rod, Colonel Francis Gabreski from Pennsylvania, joined the fight. In the same outfit was Indiana's Major Walker McHuron. Yes, 
us, we bomber boys were in good hands. But enemy flak explosions were heavy, accurate, and intense. The Germans closed in. Then came a fresh formation of Mustangs, some of Colonel Blakesley's bachelors. They came down from almost invisible heights to engage the enemy. Belgium, France, and Holland, our B-26 marauders evaded flak and unloaded over enemy airdromes. The brass hoped the weight of these bombs would force the Nazis to move their airfields inland. The plan, guided by General Sammy Anderson's boys, was succeeding. Over Germany, it was the same thing. first five days changed the history of the air war, but it didn't end here. By March, we hit Berlin for the first time. The weight of our attacks increased and held down enemy plane production. As the bombs fell, we pressed our advantage, barreling in to force the Luftwaffe into combat. without let up, went after anything that could hurt us. This was no longer a prelude to invasion. This was invasion. offensive was the culmination of the strategic air war that airmen had long advocated. 
the strong shield of Hitler's fortress, the Luftwaffe, had been swept away. As General Eisenhower proudly said, the air did everything we asked. They cleared the way for invasion. The Allies had attained freedom of the air with the combined long-range strategic bombing and tactical operations of the United States Air Force.